Good morning, DEF CON. Thank you for coming to see our session. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. A little bit about, my, a little bit about myself. My name is Dr. Bramwell Brizendine. I'm the former and founding director of the Verona Lab, which specializes in vulnerability and exploitation research. Uh, creator, creator of several different tools, the Shell Wasp, Chop Rocket, and Sherem. And I'm presently an assistant professor at UAH. Uh, I do have a PhD in cyber operations, which is a highly uh, technical uh, degree specializing in reverse engineering and exploitation. Um, just as a, as a kind of a side note, I have kind of lost my voice a bit, but it has been improving, so I'll just try to, to do the best that I can. Uh, there is some contact information down below, so feel free to uh, reach out to me if you so desire. Uh, I am joined by my graduate student, Shiva. And he is a master's of computer science student at UAH, and he's interested in writing software, uh, web apps, as well as blockchain. Uh, he's got a lot of contact information there, so feel, f feel free to reach out with any uh, opportunities for Shiva. So when we started this research, the, the goal, the idea was, can we bring something fresh, something something new to ROP because quite frankly it seemed to be getting a little bit kind of stale, kind of predictable. Uh, no doubt it, with the techniques that we used seemed to work very well but it's just a lot of the same types of things uh, over and over. Now there are a number of tools that can facilitate uh, getting uh, ROP gadgets. Uh, Mona, which of course has been around forever, ROP gadget, uh, ROPper, uh, as well as others. And additionally, for jump-oriented programming, the Jop Rocket, which is actually a tool that uh, I created myself and presented at DEF CON in 2019. So again, um, the idea is to try to make it fresh, to try to make it exciting again. Uh, and part of this inspiration is because code reuse attacks in general should be inherently um, very free, very flexible. We shouldn't be confined by the shackles of what has been done before, but instead, I'd rather see us embrace an openness, a desire to do something new, to something a little bit different. So part of my thinking is trying to kind of uh, think out of the box. So I spend a huge amount of time, uh, actually thousands of hours working with jump oriented programming. Now I didn't create it, but I did create the, the tool that helped to facilitate that. And a lot of uh, practical jobs just really had not been documented and so I set about uh, providing that documentation uh, so that people actually wanted to do something significant with it, they'd have the capability uh, of doing so. And there are a few different white papers out there that myself and Austin Babcock have, ri have written. So uh, by its very nature, JOP is extraordinarily flexible and I wanted to try to bring some of that to, to ROP and to introduce some new ideas. So uh, without further ado then, let's uh, see what some of these novel contributions may include. So the next generation state of the art uh, ROP gadget tool, ROP Rocket is going to be uh, among these. Uh, and part of, the, part of it is going to be, uh, all, everything you see here will have automatic ROP chain generation. So it will create the chains for these different techniques. Um, some of them are also in their own regard uh, novel approaches or novel techniques, so adapting Heaven's Gate to, to return oriented programming, utilizing Windows syscalls to bypass DEP rather than the traditional Windows APIs, uh, and then something that I like to call uh, shell codeless ROP where, where instead of uh, trying to avoid data ex or, or avoid uh, or trying to bypass data execution prevention and we just simply uh, avoid it and invoke that uh, shell code like functionality directly by calling the, the appropriate Windows APIs. Uh, obfuscation of, of ROP gadgets which I'll get into uh, more later on and then emulation of uh, ROP gadgets and as well as chains which does help us uh, quite significantly. Okay so we're going to start out here with uh, Heaven's Gate and ROP. And I know that uh, some of you are going to be very familiar with Heaven's Gate. For others, it may be uh, your first time encountering it. So a little bit of a history lesson. Now this is a traditional way in which we invoke it. So uh, if we're going to go from x86 transition 
to 64-bit mode. This is something that the, the Windows operating system does continuously uh, whenever we make use of an in, in, in NTDLL function. So it just happens automatically as part of uh, making use of Windows syscalls. So the, the, the old kind of uh, formula, if you want to call it that, that you'll see in malware or shellcode is you'll do uh, pu push 33 for the 33 uh, CS selector, which designates it going to 64 bit mode. And then we do call red F, call next red F, which is just an address. So the compiler would then produce that address. And then we're going to then, at that particular location, we're going to modify ESP, add 5 to it so that uh, our, our return address or destination address, as I like to call it, will be immediately after the red F. And that's typically how, we, uh, how it's always done when you see this, but the reality is you don't have to have that return address or that destination address. Uh, immediately after the red F, it could be anywhere in process memory. So that's a tremendous amount of flexibility that just isn't really being used. So uh, of course we're not writing shell code, we are writing uh, return oriented programming so we need to find a new way to, to do that because we can't just simply write shell code. So uh, we, we are introducing a couple new ways to do that that will um, allow us to perform Heaven's Gate. And by doing this, we can thereby expand the attack surface from uh, WoW 64, which means we're working in 32-bit, we're emulating a 32-bit application, uh, to 64-bit mode. Now you could do the opposite if you wanted. I don't really see much of a point, but th th that's fine. You can still do it. So uh, our approach here is we're going to be utilizing the push add instruction. So if you're familiar with virtual alloc or virtual protect, uh, the types of change produced by something like Mona, it's following the same idea. And Shiva will be talking a little bit more about uh, how this works. Um, but these are the patterns for, uh, for Heaven's Gate. So we have 11 of them. And I can actually increase it to, to more than those uh, 11. And uh, so if one of these d is not able to work, then the tool will just simply try another one. Now these gadgets are not exceedingly difficult to find, so very likely we will succeed. So let's take a look here at pattern seven. So we just simply load up the registers with the uh, appropriate values. Uh, and these values, a lot, a lot of them are very simple. They're ROP knobs or, uh, in this case, when we do the push add, it's gonna push them in a predefined order. So it'll go EDI, ESI, all the way to EAX. And so we'll have there that RET uh, zero uh, C, and that's gonna skip over a bunch of stuff. It'll, it'll firstly execute the ROP knob in ESI, and then it'll skip over stuff until we get to that jump de de reference EBX. And then that will then cause us to go to EBX. What is EBX? Well, that's the red F. And so then the red F will then uh, cause, that's gonna, what's gonna initiate the heaven's gate. And then on the stack, after that, we'll have uh, the, the destination address and the 33 selector. So everything will be perfectly set up and it should work. So let's take a look at the stack before and after. So uh, DDESP, we can see we have our re destination address and the 33 selector. And then after that red F, uh, they're gone. And you'll notice that the, the address is now a Q word instead of a D word, it has expanded. And we have actually switched architectures. So uh, we have that red F up above and then down below, again, everything, we have Q words and then notice we have push uh, RBP instead of uh, EBP, so we have switched to 64-bit to mode. Now, just one little note for those who may not be aware, the only time you can actually view this is if you're in the 64-bit version of uh, WinDebug. Any other debugger will not work or it will produce uh, aberrant behavior, and there's no reason you can't uh, open up a 32-bit application and then attach it with a 64-bit uh, WinDebug. Let's take a look quickly here at pattern number 11. Now this one is very, very simple. So we have a couple ROP knobs. We have a pop EBP to consume the, the, the ESP, which we just want to skip. Uh, we have another ROP knob and then the red F and everything is set up. We have the destination address and we have the 33 selector. So okay, we've done the heaven's gate. Uh, what is the advantage of this? Why do we want to do this? It's a good question. Wow, excellent question. So uh, by doing this, there could 
be many more registers, 64-bit registers, and the idea is maybe there's something that we we want to do in 32-bit mode, but we just don't have the right gadgets. But if we expand it to 64-bit mode, maybe there are additional gadgets. Now, um, the reality is a lot of times, however, um, there may not be some of these extra 64-bit gadgets just, just because the bytes re required to produce them may not be there. And so um, sometimes they will be purely by happenstance. And additionally, there can be some very valuable structures that are accessible in x64, which you can access via the R R12 register. For instance, the, the tab 64. You get the tab 64, you can go to tab 32, and then pep 32, and pep 64. So it's actually immensely valuable. So if you can do that and then leak the R12, then that's very useful. Okay, so we've done uh, x86. We want to go back to x64 because otherwise you're in 64-bit mode for 32-bit application. Uh, technically, you could call 64-bit uh, NTDL functions. Uh, that'd be very difficult. Uh, it's not something that I personally would recommend uh, trying to do. Uh, people out, out there have done that uh, in terms of um, malware development, but I don't think it's too terribly realistic for, for return-oriented programming. So at this stage, we would want to return back, back to um, x86. Um, and so we have a forbidden gadget, unfortunately. So the push ad simply doesn't exist. So if you try to do a push ad, you'll see hex 60 and three question marks. How sad. So in this case, we're going to do a series of move dereferences. And uh, it's kind of like a snipe gadget, so we'll create an allocation of memory and we'll just set up what we want the stack to be and then we'll do a stack pivot and then everything should be, should be good and jolly. So we'll take a look at some of these uh, different uh, steps that we can, can take. So first thing we want to do, we want to get a pointer to memory. Let's make it easy and simple. We can do ESP. And we're going to go move ahead 250 bytes. And that's going to be our point of reference where we're going to start building our different uh, parameters, our return address, et cetera. And we're not going to do every little thing here because it'll be a little bit tedious. We'll do, do a few of them. So uh, we do want to write the, the red F because remember that red F is going to be what's going to kick it off. It's, that, it's a far ret. We only, we're not going to typically do that and, and ROP, but it does allow us to initiate the heaven's gate. So we'll get a, a red F. It doesn't matter which red F. And we'll write that address there. And we do that with a move D reference. So it's move D word pointer RBX EAX. And it's not a Q word, uh, which some of you who are very observant may notice. Um, it's going to be a lot more common. You'll see the D words just because you're going from 32 bit to 64 bit. And um, a lot of times when you do a move D reference technique, which is very uh, effective, by the way, in traditional ROP, you'll do a series of four increments. Well, guess what? It's not going to work out too well. Uh, with, with this because the, the bytes to produce those increments uh, will no longer produce increments. So the only increments you have will be created by happenstance. So instead we'll just do an add register, register, uh, and do a distance of four. It's a little bit more tedious, uh, but it's something that the tool can automate for us. So we don't have to worry about it too much. Um, and then we also want to finish writing the address of the red F because remember we're 64 bit mode, so we're, we needed to do a Q word rather than a D word, and our move dereference gadget was a D word. So we're going to do uh, XOR EAX EAX, the result is zero. And we're going to write that there so we get a monstrously long uh, a red F gadget address there. And then now we need to do the destination address in the 23 selector. So the 23 selector allows us to go back to 64-bit mode. Um, and this is kind of where it's kind of a little weird, kind of funky. Um, we're 64-bit mode. We've been dealing with Q words, but now we're going to go back to, to D words. So we're going to represent the, the destination address in the 23 selector is D words. Hey, it makes our life a little bit easier, so I'm not complaining. So uh, I, I didn't show the steps for those, uh, but now what we want to do is do a stack pivot. And of course, there are many different ways to do a stack pivot. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to uh, get, get it aligned so that um, 
RAX, which is kind of where our, we've been building our gadgets, we want it to, to, to point to, to the red F. And so we're going to do uh, a very long 16 digit number, which is actually equal to negative 12. And then once we do that, then um, we can just take another before and after. So do DDESP. We have the, the return address and the 23 selector. And then after that, you'll notice that x86 is present. And um, we have succeeded. We've gone back to x86. So let's actually do a quick little demo here. Okay, it's all set up for us. So there's our push ad. And uh, we can do that red F right there. So it's going to be the first red F. We're going to go from x86 to x64. We have destination address, 33 selector. So now we are in x64. You can see that registers have indeed changed. That's awesome. And we're going to skip ahead a little bit to not be too tedious. And we are going to uh, we're at the red F to go from X64 to X86. Let's look at the stack. We have the destination address and the 23 selector. And now we're back at X86. So we did it. We did two Heaven's Gates uh, right there in that little demo. Okay, so uh, this novel form of Heaven's Gate, again, it's going to allow us to go back and forth uh, between them. Obviously, a consideration is going to be the size of the payload. We want to be very, uh, we want, definitely want to be aware of that. And it's really designed for, uh, for WoW 64 or 32-bit uh, applications. I mean, you, there's no reason you can, can't do it in the 64-bit mode. I just can't really think of a good reason why, except maybe just for the novelty of it. Uh, and again, this, this is potentially capable of expand, expanding the attack surface. Um, and the, the technique or the approach that we've introduced is a little bit more complex and different from the, the standard approach that we showed you earlier. Okay, so we're going to segue into our uh, next topic here, which is going to be uh, Windows syscalls. So very uh, briefly, I'm going to speed through some of these just to kind of refresher uh, for some people. So what is a Windows syscall? Um, it's going to be something where you, you could call a kernel 32 function like virtual alloc that will call an NTDL function such as NT allocate virtual memory and then that uh, NTDL function will then call a Windows syscall. In order to do that, it will load into EAX the appropriate SSN syscall system number. And then uh, you transition from user mode to kernel mode. And then after that, um, there's a bunch of stuff going on in kernel mode. It's really outside the scope of this. So this is not something that's really intended for the average programmer uh, to be doing. And the appeal of Windows syscalls is um, it's much, much harder for it to be hooked by EDR and to, be, to, to prevent it from, from, from working. Um, so that can definitely be very beneficial. Uh, malicious eight Windows APIs is much easier to, to hook those, thereby preventing their, their usage. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think this has been used in uh, x86 uh, WoW 64. Again, that's the 32-bit. Um, now, if you're doing syscalls in 64-bit mode, the, the technique and approach is going to be a little bit different. You can actually use an actual syscall instruction. 64-bit instruction, you're not going to be using that and um, while 64 we'll be doing things in a different way. And one of the, the issues with syscalls is we have a, what we call a problem of portability. So with Windows 10, for instance, um, that SSN potentially could change. You have more than 13 different OS builds. So sometimes those SSNs will stay the same, but other times they will change. So you could have um, I think uh, NT protect virtual memory, I think for Windows 7 is hex 15, and I think for Windows 10 and 11, it's hex 18. So um, those have changed. Others will change much more frequently, some less frequently. So very briefly, let's um, go over how we could reverse engineer them. So Windows 7, what we're going to be looking for is that call D word FSC0 that will point to a special address, which will be a far jump. And you can see we're loading into EAX hex 15. Um, so, oh, I guess it's NT allocate virtual memory. It was off there. 
And uh, that FS register is going to be pointing to the, the thread environment block. Um, so what we can do is we can weaponize that, we can utilize that, that now that FSC0 is going to be a reliable uh, way for us to interface with that and the FS is actually a register so it's going to always be there so we just need to, to get a, uh, instructions that have the FS in it and GS is going to be the 64 bit equivalent. And so there you see the, you have a jump and you have a 33 selector and colon and then the address so that will be switching to 64 bit mode so that will be a form of heaven's gate in and of itself. And Windows 10 is a little bit different so uh, we have hex 18 and T allocate virtual memory and the um, setup is a little bit different but for our purposes we don't really care because we go to FSC0 it's going to be pointing to that same address so we can still continue to use that FSC0. In Windows 11 things are a little bit different again but again that Windows 7 way of invoking the syscalls is still able to, to work. So uh, as many of you are aware a lot of a Windows based ROP is going to be focused on bypassing mitigations. One of the most prevalent mitigations is going to be data execution prevention which says that memory should be readable and writable or executable but not both. That doesn't mean it can't be both, it can be but we need to use certain APIs or, or syscalls in order to make that happen. Virtual alloc, we created a region of memory that has the, the desired permissions, v virtual protect, we modify the permissions of existing memory allocations. So those are some very old, very uh, simple ways of doing it and can be easily blocked. Uh, there are al alternative ways as well or ways to make them work. Uh, but Windows syscalls is going to be something that is uh, a, little bit, a little bit more low level, a little bit deeper way of, of doing this. Um, and again those syscall SSNs do change but the good news is for, for Windows um, 10 and 11 they're going to stay the same for the th two that we care about and Windows 7 is going to be the same. So. Um, that works out uh, very well for us. We don't, what this means practically speaking is we don't have to worry about um, resolving the OS build like you would if you were using a traditional Windows syscall tool. We can just say okay I'm attacking Windows 10, I'm doing Windows 11, I've done a little bit of reconnaissance, I know <laughs> about my targets so um, we can dispense with that step. It's not necessary for these particular APIs. And I think it'd be a lot more challenging to uh, to do that in um, in ROP, but uh, maybe we'll do that later on. So how do we perform these uh, the Windows syscall in Windows 10 and 11, particularly while 64? Well, that can be a little bit challenging, but ultimately, as long as we follow the proper calling convention, whether it be for the API or the syscall, it's going to work. So we just simply get the stack aligned properly. Uh, with the return addresses and notice I did say return addresses that's not a I didn't misspeak there it, it is indeed plural for, for Windows syscalls um, and then initiate things and it, and it should work. So uh, we'll see how that works here um, shortly. So important Windows syscalls th that are this tool utilizes is going to be NT allocate virtual memory the deeper version of virtual alloc and NT protect virtual memory which is the deeper version of virtual protect. So we're going to focus here on NT protect virtual memory. From a ROP standpoint it's a little bit more challenging to set up and one of the big things with Windows syscalls is instead of just using direct values like your Windows APIs you'll have a lot of pointers. So a pointer is going to be you go inside of the pointer and it has that value so we need to somehow um, create these pointers for, for base address number of bytes to protect and uh, old access protection. And if we do that then um, we should be in a good position. So we're using the move dereference ap approach rather than the push add approach and um, so we want to get a, a point of reference to memory. This is going to be where we are going to build our parameters, our return addresses and we're going to put uh, a gadget there to invoke the Windows syscall which we'll talk about momentarily. So we'll just move uh, ESP to EAX and then push it ahead 250 bytes. 
Uh, now, well, this is going to be something that will be a little bit different for a lot of people is we need to set up a value for, for a pointer. How do we do this uh, in ROP? And my solution is, uh, so you could either do increments or decrements. I've choos chosen to do uh, decrements um, for the automation and for this example. And so we're just going to build the values for the pointers immediately after the parameters and then that just makes it easier for us to then move the pointers over to uh, the parameters where, 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 they, where they need to be. So get base address value for pointer is what we're creating here. And this may look a little weird if you're scrutinizing it very closely. We moved ESP into EAX and now I'm moving that into EBX. So that doesn't really seem to make much sense, does it? Why am I not choosing a better one? Well, uh, I'll address that in a little bit. Um, and so then we then write that base address to, to memory with a, a move dereference. And then we have a series of four decrements. So we then decrement to our next slot that we will then initialize with the next uh, value for another pointer. And this one is going to be number of bytes to protect. And if you look very closely, I'm putting one byte. I'm going to protect one byte. That's kind of bizarre. <laughs> Um, I'll explain that again momentarily. It's kind of a, what I like to call a little trick just to, to save on gadgets. So we'll write that with a move dereference and four decrements. And I'm also going to, at this point, I'm going to save a point of reference to the number of bytes, um, moving that into EDI. I'll be using that in a little bit. And I'm going to skip through some of these. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. There is going to be a white paper, so if you want to scrutinize the entire source code, you'll have that av available as well as the tool itself. So then uh, we've skipped a little bit here, but giving the pointer is a parameter. So we have the point of reference now in EDI. We're going to move EDI into EBX, and now we're going to increment EBX four times. So we're incrementing, not decrementing. And then we're going to write that to uh, EAX. And that's going to be our number of bytes to protect, which again is just the value of one, which is odd. And so now I'm going to explain why I'm doing some of these kind of bizarre and odd type things. So the base address, um, what we're going to do is, is we're going to get it to, to round down to, the, to the, the base address of that particular allocation. So I don't need to be precise here. A number of bytes, it, because it's so low, it's just going to round up to the maximum size for that allocation. So in some of my examples, that allocation maximum size was 1,000 bytes. So it'll be uh, 1,000 bytes. Uh, and that will just happen automatically for us. So we don't have to tediously try to put a particular value in there that's not necessary. So let's try to finish things up. And uh, again, I, I alluded to the fact that we're going to have two return addresses. And so if you were trying to do this and you do one return address, it's never going to work because it's an insufficient number. So you would really only know this if you were going through and reverse engineering um, very closely. Um, so in any case, uh, we go ahead and write that. And you'll notice a lot of these gadgets are repetitive, the same gadgets. That's just how a lot of this types of type of things works. And then we do another return address. In this case, it's just simply a, a ROP NOP, a RET. It doesn't really do anything. But we could also um, make that something else if we wanted. So now we're going to write our Windows syscall, our method of invoking that to the stack. And so there are a number of ways in which to do that. The one that I prefer the most is going to be something like push D word pointer FS uh, and then EDX. Um, and that EDX, we can then change that to, to C0. Now, a more desirable one would be like push D word pointer uh, FS C0. Uh, but something like that is going to be so obscure, it's not likely to be found. Uh, but we just simply write that address to the stack. And there are many other possibilities where the FS register is present and we could select one of them and we can manip manipulate things in such a fashion that they could be in the form of a push ret. Um, we don't have, to have time to talk about that, but there are a lot of other possibilities. Just as long as we can kind of leak that FS reg register, then we're good. And if there is not a direct way, well, we actually could potentially find that from the R12 register via Heaven's Gate, 
It's a little bit more tedious to set that up. Uh, and the automation actually doesn't do that, uh, at least not at present. So we want to also specify NT protect virtual memory. All we got to do is just load the appropriate SSN. So it's going to be hex 50 for Windows 10. And if you're doing a Windows 7, there are going to be additional steps. So the ECX will need to be zero. And then EDI will then need to load the first parameter uh, address or, or pointer. And there are a few different ways you can do that through ROP and the, the white paper will go into some more detail. Uh, you can do this with Windows 10. It doesn't hurt, any, hurt anything. It just does, is not required. And then our final step here is uh, do a stack pivot to, to the start of everything. So start of um, uh, invoking the, the syscall. So let's look at our ESP. We have the pointer to, uh, of the gadget to invoke the syscall. We have a return address, two of them, and then our NT protect virtual memory addresses. Um, we can go ahead and do that. We have the, the push D word pointer FS EBX. That then takes us to a far jump. And then after that call, we can see our return addresses are still there. There is no stack cleanup. You're responsible for that yourself. So you might want to do a small little stack pivot uh, with your return address uh, or one of them. And um, you can see the size has been upgraded to 1,000 bytes. And the base address has been provided rather than the address that we had input previously. And we could look at the VPROC uh, permissions there. And it's 18, are we at page execute uh, read write? Um, NT allocate virtual memory. The setup is going to be similar. Um, we're not going to go into that, just in the interest of time. We'll do a quick little demo here. All right, so we are going to get things set up right here. We're doing that uh, far jump to invoke the, uh, this is messed up. Oh, let's just skip this demo. All right, uh, with that, we are going to change directions a bit and we are going to um, talk about Shellcoless ROP and invite my co-speaker. Hey everyone. Um, the purpose of this exploit is to have three different Windows APIs working together collectively. This allows us to realize more advanced attack than just having just one API. We can implement the functionality of a shell code directly without needing to bypass step and without actually having a shell code. This one is relatively simple. Uh, we'll use the load library to get the handle to the module, also known as H module, and then pass it to get proc address um, to get the runtime address of the system, and then system enables us to execute any command. Let's talk briefly about some of these APIs. Load library. The purpose here is to load a DLL or a module, or if it is already loaded, which is in a lot of times, we simply return the address of it. That is the H module. We have the handle to the module now, which is the absolute requirement. Our return address, which is ROP now, which will then take us to the next gadget. Get proc address allows us to take that handle and then we can provide the name of the function and then function gives us the runtime address of the system. Then there is return address as well. Finally, the most important API is going to be system which allows us to execute system commands directly. In this case, we are doing proof of concept string calc.exe, but you can use any command you want to execute. Our point with this is not just to call this one time, but in a sense is to create a recipe so that we can automate the ROP chain generation, which enables us to do it on many different binaries. Next, we're going to talk about finding patterns. How do we find patterns for a specific Windows API? First, determine the push at order. As you can see from the above table, the EDI is in slot 1 ranging all the way till EAX in slot 8. Pushart puts the registers on the stack in predefined predictable order. 
This pushhead order is helpful to create many patterns. This is one set of patterns that could be used. We have many that we are we going to talk about later. Each register holds a value, but in the case of ESP, we'll always keep over it. This is a pattern for system. As you can see, each register holds a value or a ROP gadget. <coughs> for command, we have to provide the pointer to the command, and command will be part of the payload. This is one of the scripts that is generated by ROP Rocket. Each register has its own slot. It is usually not that difficult to load registers, but in the case of EAX, it is using a temporary register EBX to locate the string MSVCRT on the stack dynamically. I would have to calculate that value manually, but with emulation, ROP Rocket can do that for you. At the end of all the slots, we have push out. Let's see what happens after push out. Let's take a look at the stack values. The ROP knob is in EDI, and then there is RedChild, which will execute the next one and skip over the following two. Then there is load library pointer and jump dereference to that load library along with the return address and MSVCRT as the parameter. As you can see, the value of EAX is a base address of MSVCRT. This is the result for get proc address as well. As you can see, the value is like runtime address of system. And finally, if all three ROP chain functions correctly, the command will be executed which is just popping up a calculator at this point. This is a good demonstration of using shellcodeless ROP. We are able to execute um, shellcode-like functionality without needing to bypass step. But seriously, you can do a lot more than just popping up a boring calculator. The possibilities are endless. Throughout this research, I have created a lot of time to develop these patterns, trial and error, experimentation with debuggers, and these are some of the patterns I found. Here we have a dozen patterns for load library. And here I have like 11 patterns for get proc address. And finally, nine patterns for system. I created these patterns for raw rocket. If it is not able to build the chain using one pattern, it can go and try the other one. Since we have a lot of patterns, it is likely to succeed. If one pattern fails due to lack of ROP gadgets, having multiple patterns can be really helpful. Let's take a look at the demo. Here is a script generated by ROP Rocket, uh, and there is a payload at the bottom of the script. We have like three push ads. We're going to stop at the third push ad. And we finally execute the push ad. We'll get inside the system. We are jump dereferencing to the system. And now we are inside the system. We're going to step out of that. And here we go. Thank you very much, Shiva. So the purpose with this shell coolers, um ROP attack is to, again, automate the whole process so that we can have one of a multitude of, pro of possibilities and then ROP rocket. If one doesn't work, then there are many others that are available. Uh, we have created other changes as well that are not currently part of the tool, but will be included in the future, such as uh, get proc address at low library, um, URL download, download the following and create process A so you can download a file from the internet and then execute it. Okay, so uh, on to the next topic, uh, obfuscation of ROP gadgets. Now, why do a lot of ROP gadgets fail? Uh, sometimes it may be due to the recipe uh, used to, to generate them. Um, we may need particular gadgets that simply cannot be found, or it could be bad bytes. So bad bytes could be something like you have a push ad, but there are bad bytes there. We could also call some of these uh, gadgets that have bad bytes uh, forbidden gadgets. They're not supposed to be accessible because of uh, the so-called bad bytes, but what if we were to, to encode them or obfuscate them? Could we use them directly? So this is a, a script uh, created by a student of mine, Bailey Bel Belisario, a few years back during the pandemic. And it was a challenging assignment, and the, the only push out available wasn't really something that could be easily done because of um, bad bites. And so he essentially 
uh, encoded it and then decoded it in memory and then used that push ret to then cause it to be executed. So very clever, very uh, elite, if you will. And how he did that was an integer overflow. So that integer overflow will exceed the con constraints of a D word and then be truncated, producing the desired result. So he used a found ad gadget to do that and then a push um, EAX return. So four very common ways to encode a value, all supported by RopRocket, Zor, Not, Neg, and uh, Integer Overflow. So here's an example produced by RopRocket, which gives us some lovely commentary, uh, <laughs> the Neg gadget. And it just automates that so you can specify hex 40, read, write, executable, and it'll do the magic for you. So these are pretty simple. Other tool tools can do these. We have the not gadget there. Uh, we have the Zor gadget, so we can weaponize that. We have a, a couple pops, and then the Zor giving us the desired result. And we also have a found Zor gadget, so we can evaluate the, something like Zor EAX1 and figure out, hey, it needs uh, 41 in order to create uh, hex 40. And then integer overflow with a found uh, add gadget. So we have add EAX and some large number. And the ROP rocket will calculate exactly what it needs to be to, to produce hex 40. And then also integer overflow where we have two pops. Uh, and then we do an add register register. And in this case, we're doing hex 40 uh, once again. So you can input it a desired value. And the tool will just automatically do this on its own. So ROP Rocket is actually very special in terms of how it generates these uh, integer overflows. It will have start out with 10 predetermined values. If those fail, it will generate the, it from the available character set. It will keep on doing that using its own unique formula until it finds a set of two values that are free of bad bytes and produce the desired uh, value. So, uh, let's get back to our example from, from uh, Bailey. Can we be elite? Uh, <laughs> sorry. And uh, do an injury overflow to get our push ad. And so um, in this case, we actually can. So it starts out with uh, uh, eight E's, a rather large number, and then we add another uh, value, and that gives us an integer overflow producing 40, 1, 8, 1, 12, which is indeed push ad. And so this is something that Rock Rocket can just uh, automate and do in you know, less than a second. Makes our life a little bit easier. We can also do that with a found ad gadget too. It's another option. And we get the same exact result. And so that push EX red allows us to access that forbidden gadget. So highly effective as a way to obscure um, or obfuscate ROP gadgets. And so it uh, greatly expands the number of possibilities. Uh, so the tool does have a remake function. So that remake function can allow us to, if something doesn't work um, because of bad bytes, we can still use it and we can remake it by encoding it and then having it decoded on the fly and then do a push for it. So that really, really expands the attack surface. So the tool is really fast. It does have parallelism to maximize available cores, persistence. So um, if you've already evaluated a, a, a binary, it'll save um, the, the gadgets found. And you can see some of what it looks like right there. Um, and it also provides emulation. The emulation is done internally. Uh, so it can evaluate each and every gadget if it needs to to try to find something that may be suboptimal. So an optimal gadget could be a very short, brief gadget like uh, add EBX5, and then a less optimal one may have other uh, intervening lines, but it might be okay. So um, the emulation can allow us to find other possibilities, and this is not something you would see. It's just internal debugging output. And it also will uh, emulate uh, actual ROP chains. So sometimes we need to calculate the distance to a parameter because we need a pointer. And so it can recursively uh, do that. And how it will work is it will start with a guess. And if it's wrong, it probably will be wrong. It'll try again. And it'll use the output to try to get it closer. And we'll keep doing that recursively until it is correct. And it's smart enough that it knows when it has actually achieved its goal. And so that's some more internal debugging information there. 
And there is a great deal of metadata to help facilitate that. So it has return addresses, this is a syscall, uh, different parameters. And so it can check to see, um, you know, if we've achieved a certain particular goal. And so calculating distances for certain types of syscalls uh, or even some of the, what, what Shiva did is going to be nece necessary for success. And so that emulation makes some of this possible. Without this emulation, we couldn't do that. So uh, it is immensely useful. Uh, we are, we have come to the conclusion of our talk. Uh, the tool is not up right now, but it should be up uh, about sometime in the next week or so. Uh, so go ahead and take a, a picture of that if you like, and um, be sure to check it out. And if you have any feedback, um, be sure to let us know. Uh, we are happy to meet down there and take any questions. I think we're about out of our time. So uh, thank you very much for attending our session and hope you enjoy the rest of your DEF CON.